Can I do anything for you? You do too much. College, a job, all this time with me. You're not Superman, you know. Who am I? You sure you want to know? The story of my life is not for the faint of heart. If somebody said it was a happy little tale, if somebody told you I was just your average, ordinary guy, not a care in the world, somebody lied. To encode an entirely new genome, combining the genetic information from all three spiders into these 15 genetically designed super spiders. There's 14. One's missing. Uh, Peter, may I introduce my father, Norman Asborn? Heard so much about you. Great honor to meet you, sir. Harry tells me you're quite the science whiz. You know, I'm something of a scientist myself. The performance enhancers aren't ready. The data just doesn't justify this test. 40,000 years of evolution, and we barely even tapped the vastness of human potential. Huh. Uh, can I take your picture? I, I need one with a student in it. Sure. do exactly the same thing at your age. Are you all right? Uh, I'm fine. No, not exactly. So where are you going after you graduate? I want to move into the city. What other skills do you have, Parker? I was thinking of something in photography. I'd like a job, sir. No jobs? Freelance. Best thing in the world for a kid your age. These are the years when a man changes into the man he's going to become the rest of his life. What the hell was that? What was that thing? Whatever it is, somebody has to stop it. Remember, with great power, Great responsibility. Who are you? Your friendly neighborhood Spider Man. On the 3rd of May 2002, Spider-Man swung onto the big screen and crawled his way to the box office making $821 million worldwide. It broke box office records on its opening day weekend, it was the most successful film that year in the USA and is to this day the most successful origin story of a superhero at the box office. The film didn't arrive in the UK until a month later and was given the 12 rating by the BBFC. Sony were pushing for a PG for its UK market, but the BBFC felt the violence was too graphic for younger viewers. However, that year the BBFC did introduce a 12A rating, which allowed younger viewers to attend screenings accompanied by an adult. Sony decided to re-release the film two months later with the new rating to help boost profits and to take advantage of the younger fanbase. After the terrorist attacks on the United States on September 11th, 2001, Sony recalled teaser posters which showed a close-up of Spider-Man's face, with New York's World Trade Center towers reflected in his eyes. The film's original teaser trailer was removed from previews. The teaser didn't contain much footage from the actual film, but mostly exclusive material, very much like the T2 teaser from 1991. It featured a mini-plot involving a group of bank robbers escaping in a helicopter, which gets caught in a giant net. The camera pulls back to reveal a gigantic spider web spun between the World Trade Center towers. The two towers do feature in the film in one quick shot, as Spider-Man looks quickly at camera. 
Spider-Man hadn't had much luck with live action features and shows. The greatest success came with the arrival of the Spider-Man cartoon in 1994, which ran for five seasons. During the late 70s, CBS had commissioned a series that was loosely based on the character. It didn't last long despite large viewing figures. The network wasn't particularly happy with a lot of kids tuning in and wanted their content to appeal to adults. Nicholas Hammond stepped into the role of Peter Parker and Spider-Man, and he was the Spidey I grew up on. The show didn't have many episodes, totalling 14 in all. Some were packaged together and released as a movie in parts of the world. These were made on TV budgets. They are very cheap and don't feature any of the classic villains from the comics. It was just a show with Spider-Man battling crooks. I watched many of these when the BBC repeated them in the late 80s and early 90s. Marvel Comics weren't doing very well financially during the 80s and sold many licenses to film studios to option movies on their catalogue of characters. Canon Films had picked up Captain America and Spider-Man, but also Superman from the Soul Kinds, who had optioned him from DC Comics in the 70s. Canon Films had started pre-production on Spider-Man with director Joe Zito, but during the later part of the 80s, Canon Films were struggling with their finances, resulting from too many box office bombs. Superman 4 failed due to heavy budget cuts. Spider-Man's budget was then slashed from $20 million to $7 million, which resulted in Joe Zito leaving the project. Director Albert Pion, who would later go on to direct Captain America, was given the task of shooting Spider-Man and the intended sequel to Masters of the Universe, which was later dropped in favour of making Cyborg. There was a small amount of publicity for the Canon Films version of Spider-Man, some press photos and a comic with stuntman Scott Lever as Spider-Man, but it never got to the shooting stage as Canon needed to save money and cancelled the production. After leaving Canon Films, Menachem Golan set up 21st Century Films and was still pursuing the idea of a Spider-Man feature. A number of scripts were written but never got produced. James Cameron had wanted to develop a Spider-Man movie but didn't own the rights. Corolco Pictures, who produced Terminator 2 and Cliffhanger, had an arrangement with 21st Century Films to share distribution. Jim Cameron had developed a large 47-page treatment, which focused on the villains such as Doc Ock and Sandman. He introduced the idea of the organic web shooters, so instead of creating the web himself, it comes out of his wrist, which the Sam Raimi movie took on come 2002. By 1995, MGM had acquired the 21st Century Films library and assets, so they became the owners of all the drafts written over the years. Karolko were having money problems. After the box office disaster Cutthroat Island, and filed for bankruptcy, which halted James Cameron's Spider-Man. In 1998, Marvel were finally out of their financial troubles, with them teaming up with the toy manufacturer Toy Biz, and the rights of Spider-Man had reverted back to them, which didn't please MGM. They contested this in court, but lost. Marvel sold the Spider-Man rights to Columbia Pictures. James Cameron's script was never going to be used, but a number of elements were borrowed by David Kep who took sole writing credit for the movie, which was approved by the Screenwriters Guild, despite many others contributing to the latest revisions. Many top directors were considered for directing the movie, such as Tony Scott and David Fitcher, but they settled on Sam Raimi, who was a huge fan of the comics and had prior experience with his own superhero creation, Dark Man. The movie does have a large cast, but I'm going to focus on the characters who have an important role to the story and a couple that deserve a mention. We have Tobey Maguire as Peter Parker slash Spider-Man. Tobey was cast as Peter in July 2000, shortly after Sam Raimi got the job of directing. Sam was impressed with Tobey's performance in the Cider House Rules, although Tobey was not familiar with the character and had never read any comics when he grew up. To prepare for the role, Maguire did a lot of training. He hired a physical trainer, a yoga instructor, a martial arts expert, and took on rock climbing before shooting to improve his physique. For the DVD and Blu-ray, his screen test is available, and it's very odd. It's like they are creating a scene from a Bruce Lee movie. This was done to demonstrate that Toby could handle himself in the action scenes. Kirsten Dunst plays Mary Jane Watson, the girl who Peter Parker had a crush on since he was six years old. Mary Jane aspires to become an actress, but ends up a waitress at a rundown diner, a fact she hides from her new boyfriend, Harry. Sam Raimi was aiming to cast Alicia Witt, but after Kirsten's screen test, she successfully got the role. Willem Dafoe plays the Green Goblin, and Norman Osborn, owner of Oscorp Industries. Dafoe was cast as Osborn in November 2000, after Nicolas Cage and John Malkovich turned down the role. 
The foe had lobbied to get the part and insisted on wearing the uncomfortable costume to help convey the character's body language, which he felt a stuntman couldn't do. The foe didn't realise the suit would be so heavy and was often exhausted after shooting. James Franco plays Harry Osborn, Peter's best friend who starts dating Mary Jane Watson once they move to New York. Franco had originally wanted to play the part of Spider-Man, but after his screen test, Sam Raimi thought he would be ideal for the role of Harry. Cliff Robertson, who sadly passed away in 2011, plays Ben Parker, Peter's uncle. Cliff was an experienced actor of film and TV. Spider-Man 3 would be his last on-screen role. Ben Parker has recently lost his job as an electrician and is trying to find a new one, but at his age, he thinks it's going to be a struggle to find anything to support the family. Rosemary Harris plays May Parker. Rosemary was in her late 70s when she took on the role of Aunt May. She has been acting since 1948, appeared in dozens of films but is best known for her work in theatre. After the death of Ben, she becomes closer to Peter and tries to encourage him to open up to Mary Jane and tell her his feelings. J.K. Simmons plays J. Jonah Jameson, the grumpy and short-tempered publisher of the Daily Bugle. He hires Peter on a freelance basis to provide photos of Spider-Man because Peter is the only one who can take a decent photo of him. Having J.K. Simmons play J.J. was probably the finest casting I have ever seen in a film. He is Jonah Jameson. You bring me some more shots of that newspaper selling clown, maybe I'll take him off your hands. But I never said you have a job. Meet. I'll send you a nice box of Christmas meat. Best I can do. Get out of here. The legendary Bruce Campbell makes a cameo. Bruce often pops up in Sam's movies, due to them being very good friends and colleagues. He plays the announcer at the wrestling ring Peter takes part in, and he gives him the name of Spider-Man. We have the late macho man Randy Savage as the wrestler Bonesaw. He challenges Peter in the ring and doesn't realise how strong he is, and gets his ass handed to him. Ted Raimi is director Sam Raimi's younger brother. He plays a small role as Jameson's assistant, Hoffman. Now we all know the story of how Peter Parker becomes Spider-Man. It's a simple origin story that is effectively told in Sam Raimi's movie. Peter and Harry join their classmates for a visit to a genetics laboratory to be shown a new breed of super spider. Peter has always had a crush on his neighbour Mary Jane. He asks her to pose for a photo for the school paper. But one of the super spiders has escaped and as he takes a few snaps it lands on his hand and bites him. He heads home feeling unwell. He begins to hallucinate and passes out. Meanwhile, Harry's father Norman Osborn is battling with the military to secure an important contract. He fails to impress them due to the performance enhancing chemicals requiring more testing. He decides to experiment on himself and he goes insane. Peter awakens the next morning to find he no longer requires glasses and his physique has changed dramatically. While eating lunch at school, he discovers he can produce webs and has the ability to sense danger. Spooked out, he leaves school and begins practicing his new powers, crawling up the walls and leaping across the buildings, brushing off Uncle Ben's advice that with great power comes great responsibility. Peter leaves him on a sour note, thinking only of impressing Mary Jane with a new car. He enters an underground fighting tournament and wins his first match, but the promoter swindles him out of his money. A thief suddenly raids the promoter's office, but Peter allows him to escape, feeling cheated. Is it me or does the thief look a bit like director Luke Besson? Moments later he discovers that Uncle Ben was carjacked and has been shot and he passes away. Peter in his anger pursues and confronts the carjacker only to realise it was the thief he let escape. Peter quickly disarms him but as the carjacker attempts to flee he trips and falls to his death. Later on a military experiment is taking place for the new contractors to test their equipment. The new hardware does look like something from the film in a space. Norman Osborn suddenly appears using his new suit and glider. He attacks them and kills them all in one fell swoop. Upon graduating, Peter begins using his abilities to fight crime, donning his new costume, which I don't know how he created. Maybe Uncle Ben left him some money after he passed away, so he could pay a costume designer to make it for him. With his new persona of Spider-Man, news begins to spread of his heroic antics, and J. Jonah Jameson, head of the Daily Bugle, hires Peter as a freelance photographer, since he is the only person providing clear images of Spider-Man. Norman learns of Oscorp's board members' plan to sell the company and vote him out. He decides to take his revenge and assassinates them all at the World Unity Fair, which Peter is attending, 
Spider-Man jumps into action and reveals himself to the public, saving Mary Jane in the process. Jameson is quick to capitalise on the attack and calls the mysterious killer the Green Goblin. Industry expert John Dykstra supervised the visual effects for the film, with the bulk of the computer-generated material being handled by Sony Imageworks. Sam Raimi had wanted to do a lot of the effects within camera, and had little experience with CGI at the time, but John persuaded Sam to have a large majority of the Spider-Man footage in CG form. It would have proven difficult and dangerous for a stuntman to swing high above the city within camera. John Dykstra created a test to demonstrate what could be achieved in computer animation, and Columbia Pictures and Sam were very impressed. But the movie does employ a lot of wire work for scenes of Spider-Man jumping off camera, or landing with whoever he has saved. The fight scenes have loads of practical stunts and effects, so there is a great blend of traditional and modern methods. Due to Spider-Man's costume being red and blue and Norman Osborn's suit being green, they had to use green screen for Spider-Man and blue screen for the Green Goblin to help separate the shots. So when the actors interact with each other, they avoid this problem with shooting in live action or they would be doubled in CGI. The difficulty of conveying a character as a CGI double lies in the fact he wears a mask. You don't see his eyes or mouth. So special care was taken to bring across his humanity, but also translate Spider-Man's classic poses as he swings through the city. In addition, Dykstra's crew had to composite areas of New York City, mainly for the big battle in Times Square. I think the effects have generally stood up over time, but they have dated far more quickly than, say, Spider-Man 2. The shots of Peter wearing his homemade suit do show the CGI limitations, and the battle in Times Square has many sequences that stand out as looking a bit unfinished, or at least of their time. New York looks very flat and much like a cardboard cutout city, as they have placed the balloons over the top of the footage. When Green Goblin jumps back on his glider, it's a very muddy and unfocused shot. On the plus side, the battle in the burning building is one of my favourite of the visual effects. There's a great slow motion shot as Spider-Man jumps to avoid the spinning blades, and the combination of fire, it just looks seamless. The second unit work is tremendous. They capture some fantastic swooping shots of the city, which really come into play for the final sequence of Spider-Man embracing his powers and responsibilities. Danny Elfman returns to the super genre with a solid superhero score. He hadn't worked on a comic book movie since Batman Returns in 1992. Danny had worked with Sam on Darkman, he provided the theme to Army of Darkness and also composed the score to A Simple Plan. The score itself has a lot of familiar Elfman motifs and cues, which you can find in Darkman, Edward Scissorhands and his work on the Tim Burton Batman movies. Sam wanted three things from Danny when it came to writing the music a heroic main theme, a theme for Peter, and a love theme. When I produced my top 10 superhero soundtracks list a few months back, I personally preferred James Horner's work on Amazing Spider-Man. That is not to say I dislike this score. I think when you have a composer work on a large selection of superhero films, you will get a lot of familiarity to the music, because a composer can only produce a certain number of styles, and studios hire a composer because they want a particular sound that the composer is known for many times it can be seen as lazy. When studios just pick who is popular at the time, and not thinking if they are the right choice to give that particular superhero its musical voice. There are many great moments in the Spider-Man score that fit the character so well, such as his first attempts to crawl up the wall, the montage as he starts saving people around New York, and many of the horror elements linked to the Green Goblin are very effective, but then there are moments that have that gothic sound, that you associate with his work for Tim Burton, which I don't feel represents Spider-Man. The strange thing is, when they started showing the trailer for the film, it has a heavy bass line and funk to it, which I thought was brilliant, and I feature it in my own opening trailer. I thought this was going to be the main theme. Then when I saw the film, it had the familiar Danny Elfman music. I wasn't upset, but a little disappointed because I had jumped the gun and thought it was going to be something else. I do really like Danny Elfman's work over the years, I think he is an interesting person, and I always enjoy listening to him discuss his work. He's very honest about his methods of composing, and addresses criticisms that have been made over the years. Over the entire trilogy, I found myself listening to Christopher Young's contributions to Spider-Man 3 more than Danny's. His style and experience in horror film scoring 
added an extra layer of musical sound to the Spider-Man series and made it more refreshing to my ear. Like many superhero movies, they feature a number of rock and pop songs during the film and the end credits. Nickelback had a music video produced to promote the film. I'm not really a fan of the band or the track itself, but I'd rather have them included than Macy Gray. She seemed to disappear off the pop charts not long after the film came out. I don't really have a problem with contemporary songs being featured in a film, but it does tend to date the movie, whereas a big orchestral score is timeless. Danny Elfman's complete score and the soundtrack are both easily available on iTunes and on CD if you don't already have them in your collection. Spider-Man has generally been quite lucky with video game translations. The 16-bit era was a bit mixed with the Mega Drive version being the most successful with the fans and critics, but when it came to the world of 3D graphics, fans really got the chance to be able to swing through the city as the famous web crawler. A game based on the movie was released the same year for the PC, PlayStation 2, Xbox and Nintendo's GameCube, developed by Treyarch, and a Game Boy Advance version, which felt like an upgrade of the old 16-bit games, was handled by Digital Eclipse. The console versions of the game featured aerial combat for the first time, and to an extent allow the user to web-sling over New York openly, although not being able to land on the ground below, which was later implemented in the sequel. The game included the voice of the actors from the film, including Tobey Maguire, Willem Dafoe, and everyone's favourite B-movie actor, Bruce Campbell. The voiceover acting by the cast is a bit mixed in its quality, and it appears they haven't been given much direction but having Bruce Campbell be the main voiceover was a delight. The game's storyline takes many liberties with the movie's plotline and throws in other villains from the comics to extend the game. The graphics were very good for the time and it received mostly positive reviews from the fans and critics and it sold well. For once we got a video game based on a movie that didn't suck. Spider-Man the movie back in 2002 was something I was really looking forward to watching. I was coming up to 20 years old. I still liked the character and never grew out of liking him, but stopped reading the comics in my early teens. What really got me excited to see it was the chance to watch a Sam Raimi movie on the big screen. I had just finished studying film and media at college, and the new friends I had made while I was studying all loved the Evil Dead trilogy. As soon as we heard Sam Raimi was directing, I was so excited. It was like a match made in heaven. Today it would be like Duncan Jones directing a Judge Dredd movie. You know you're in for a good ride. Sam was a guy who did great action, horror and comedy. He could easily translate those skills to Spider-Man, but also knowing he would treat the source material with respect and he does it flawlessly. Spider-Man's origin story was always a simple tale, and the movie stays close to it but makes small alterations here and there. But in all fairness, it's very faithful. It skirts around providing lengthy character development and puts the focus of his powers centre stage. But it never forgets the heart of the story. The emotional core of Peter and his love for Mary Jane and his family remains key. The death of Ben is an important part of Peter's story arc, and Sam Raimi retains Ben's message of power and responsibility, which keeps Peter his true self. It's what motivates him and keeps him on the right path throughout the trilogy. Tobey Maguire was a very good choice for Spider-Man, and I still believe he did great work throughout the trilogy. I was happy to see him announced as Spider-Man, because I had just seen Pleasantville where he played this nerdy character who is obsessed with this classic 50s show and gets transported to that world. He has to remain in character throughout and stick to the rules and mustn't let on that he is from a different reality. If you haven't seen Pleasantville, watch it as soon as you can, it's a superb film. There's a lot in Pleasantville that demonstrates he could take on the character of Spider-Man and especially Peter Parker. Toby has a natural talent to show his emotions, and playing a nerdy character seems to come with ease for him. When it comes to the wisecracking and cocky attitude of Spider-Man, that's where he falters. He doesn't have the charisma you'd come to expect from Spidey. It may be down to the writing, because he isn't given that much to say when he is Spider-Man, and even through the sequels his dialogue is often limited. Andrew Garfield really nailed that side of Spider-Man, but was too good looking to be a nerdy, believable Peter Parker. Peter is supposed to be an average guy, someone who would go unnoticed at school and Toby fits nicely into that persona and character. The Green Goblin was always going to be a challenge in bringing him from the comics to a live action film. It could end up looking too scary for younger viewers or too silly for adult audiences. Finding a balance was key. What we got was acceptable but far from satisfying. 
he does end up looking like what many critics compared to a Power Rangers villain. In reality, you could never sell a suit like this to the military, it's ridiculous. But with it being a comic book movie, it gets away with it. It's never explained why he becomes the Green Goblin. He takes the enhancing drugs, he loses his mind instantly, and suddenly he is the Green Goblin. The separate personality is wonderfully conveyed by Defoe, and far more scary than the silly outfit, but the representation of the Goblin is left unanswered. I suppose it's just a visual representation of his dark side. Studio ADI had done tests of different masks for Defoe to wear. What they come up with is closer in design to the comic book version and super creepy as you can see. It was a hybrid of animatronics and makeup. It was unclear whether it was a mask Defoe wore or something he turned into. I'm sure it was probably a mask he put on once he became the Green Goblin to wreak havoc on New York. The photographic style for the movie has always left me with mixed feelings. Some areas it looks like a perfect representation of the comics and has that pastel coloured design similar to Superman the movie, going with a soft filtered look. And then some scenes it has a very muddy orange look to it. The DP on the movie was Dan Burgess, who the following year photographed Terminator 3, which also exhibited a similar look with a strong use of orange, which totally didn't suit the Terminator series. Sam Raimi always tended to work with the 185 to 1 aspect ratio. The movie For the Love of the Game was his first feature film he did in cinema scope. You would think Spider-Man would work best in that format to capture the beautiful architecture of New York, but he decided to revert back to the standard Academy ratio of 185 to 1. It was great Sam Raimi's frequent collaborator Bill Pope made the change to CinemaScope for the sequel and part 3. It really made a huge improvement to the scale of the series and its look. The action for the most part is very good, but there isn't as much of it as I was expecting when I first saw it and still feel the same about it today. You have this big reveal in Times Square which is a fun and over the top sequence. He beats up a few thugs doing his attempts to take photos for the bugle and he saves Mary Jane from being attacked as she walks home. Those scenes are set at night and the big battle at the end is at night time as well. Spider-Man works best for me during the daytime. His brightly coloured outfit plays so well during brightly lit scenes. At night time it feels kind of a waste. Maybe it was a choice to play it safe to hide the CGI effects. In Spider-Man 2, they thankfully had far more battles during the day. I suppose we are given so much action nowadays, we often complain they should focus more on story. With the superhero film and their eventual sequels, it's a hard balancing act. Sequels tend to amp things up more by giving us more elaborate action scenes, which can compromise the story. If the action is serving the plot, then it's perfectly fine, and Spider-Man falls into that category. But still, there are parts where we need to see more Spider-Man, instead of another conversation with his Aunt May. The Spider-Man trilogy does follow a similar pattern to the Superman movies. Sam Raimi has said a number of times the Superman films were an inspiration for him in how to approach his Spider-Man flicks. They have familiar plot points and share a similar tone. They are a bit campy in areas, colourful but respectful to the source material. Spider-Man saving Mary Jane from the Green Goblin has the classic Superman shirt rip, and it feels similar to the helicopter rescue in the first Richard Donner movie. Spider-Man 2 has him lose his powers and she finds out his true identity, just like Lois in Superman 2, and in Spider-Man 3 he turns evil in a similar vein to Superman. It feels to me like a complimentary nod or affectionate homage to those films. Spider-Man is a solid film with a more than satisfying origin story. It gives you everything you need to know about the characters and who they are and their overall importance to Spider-Man's world. They could have given us a bit more time with some of the characters, we don't get to see Peter being his nerdy self that much, and it only hints that he had a job with Dr. Connors, but lost it due to being Spider-Man, so there are parts they cut out or never elaborate on to keep the story moving. It's a shame we didn't get a definitive version of the Green Goblin, there is still a lot that needs to be done to get his character right, and not just use him as a stepping stone to bring in other villains, or see him get killed off after one movie. It's a bit like Tim Burton's Batman, killing off the most important villain was a bit of a misstep for the sequels. Kirsten Dunst is a believable Mary Jane. Her and Toby have great chemistry. It's nice to see her fall in love with Peter and not Spider-Man. It's sad by the end he has to make the choice not to be with her because he has chosen to pursue his new life as Spider-Man and doesn't want to put Mary Jane into harm's way. The casting choices are really spot on. J.K. Simmons is solid gold in every scene. I would love a whole movie dedicated to J. Jonah Jameson. Spider-Man is an important movie to many people, especially to those who are in their 20s now. 
For many kids who grew up in the late 90s, their first trip to the cinema might have been to see Spider-Man and it was their first big budget superhero experience. It made a huge impression on them like Superman the movie did to me and like many in the early 90s with Batman. As I mentioned earlier, I was in my late teens when I first saw it. Although I had a sense of nostalgia for the character, I never really had an emotional connection to the film. I thought it was a satisfying start to kick off Spider-Man's cinematic journey. It was great to see them stay true to the comic books, but balance it out with a sense of fun and touches of seriousness. We could thankfully move on from the over-the-top and silly attempts by Joel Schumacher with his Batman sequels. Blade and X-Men both restored some faith in the comic book movie genre, but Spider-Man really enforced that confidence with the public and Hollywood were now more than desperate to capitalise on the superhero genre once again. What are we gonna call this guy? Uh, uh, Dr. Octopus. Yeah, that's crap. Uh, uh, Science Squid? Crap. Dr. Strange. That's pretty good, but it's taken. Wait, wait, I got it. Dr. Octopus. Uh, but uh, I like it. Of course you do. New villain in town. Doc Ock. Mary Jane Watson. Oh boy, if she only knew how I felt about her. But she can never know. I made a choice once to live a life of responsibility. A life she can never be a part of. Who am I? I'm Spider-Man, given a job to do. And I'm Peter Parker. And I too have a job. Parker, hello. You're fired. Why? Dogs catching frisbees? Pigeons in the park, a couple of geezers playing chess? We got six minutes to deadline, Jonah. We need page Parker, one. I don't pay you to be a sensitive artiste. I pay you because for some reason that psycho Spider-Man will pose for you. Spider-Man won't let me take any more pictures. You've turned the whole city against him. A fact I'm very proud of. I like seeing you tonight, Peter. He's waiting for you, pal. Boy, she looks at you or doesn't look at you. I don't have time for girls right now. Why, he dead? I've been kind of busy. Look at you, Peter. Your grades have been steadily declining. You always appear exhausted. We're actually funding one of your idols, Pete. Otto Octavius. I'm writing a paper on him. You want to meet him? Today, you will witness the birth of a new fusion-based energy source. Safe, renewable energy, and cheap electricity for everyone. Are you sure you could stabilize the fusion reaction? This is my life's work. I certainly know the consequences of the slightest miscalculation. Fasten your seatbelts. What are you doing? Hold the plug! Crazy scientist turns himself into some kind of a monster. Four mechanical arms welded right onto his body. <laughs> Guy named Otto Octavius winds up with eight limbs. I want us to be friends, Harry. I want us to trust each other. And be honest with me. If you knew who he was, would you tell me? We could rebuild. Enlarge the containment field. Make it bigger and stronger than ever. The power of the sun in the palm of my hand. Nothing will stand in our way. Kill Spider-Man, he'll give you all the tritium you need. A second thought, bring him to me, alive. How do I find him? Peter Parker. Oh. The 30th of June 2004, Spider-Man swung back onto the big screen in Spider-Man 2 in the USA and made its way to the UK on the 16th of July. Director Sam Raimi returns to direct this $200 million budgeted feature, which went on to gross over $780 million worldwide, making it the third most successful film that year behind Shrek 2 and Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, but also didn't manage to top the first Spider-Man film at the box office. 
The film received rave reviews at the time from critics and fans alike, with Roger Ebert saying it was the best superhero film to date since Superman the movie. When it came time for the Oscars, it was nominated for three Academy Awards, winning one for visual effects. The Spider-Man series had now become the most popular superhero franchise on the big screen to date, and the web-slinger gained an even bigger fan base worldwide, with people young and old. With all big franchise pictures came a slew of merchandise with fast food and drink tie-ins, with the likes of Burger King and Dr Pepper. The best thing to come out of all the spin-off media associated with the film was the video game, which will be discussed later. After finishing up the first Spider-Man film, Sam Raimi started work straight away on the sequel with the intention to use Dr Octavius, who was originally intended for the first picture as the next main villain, with appearances from the Lizard and Black Cat. The Black Cat was going to come between Peter and MJ. Sony hired the writers and producers of the then-hit TV show Smallville to pen the first draft with its working title The Amazing Spider-Man, but the studio and Sam Raimi weren't satisfied with the results, as the script started to make radical changes as Dr Octavius became infatuated with Mary Jane. His mechanical limbs use endorphins to counteract the pain of them being attached to his body, which he becomes addicted to. Producer Avi Arid rejected the love triangle between MJ and Dr Octavius, and the storyline of Harry Osborn putting a price on Spider-Man's head he found unsuitable. Writer Michael Shaman came on board to do further rewrites, and about a third of his work would eventually end up in the movie. David Kep, who had written the screenplay for the first film, provided uncredited rewrites to the now mounting drafts. Raimi shifted through the previous scripts, picking what he liked with veteran screenwriter Alvin Sargent. He felt that thematically the film had to explore Peter's conflict with his personal wants against his responsibility. What does it mean to be a superhero, for example, touching upon Peter's lonely existence? Raimi took inspiration from Superman 2, as Kal-El chose to become a normal human being wanting to be with Lois, and borrowing elements from The Amazing Spider-Man issue number 50, titled Spider-Man No More. The script was streamlined, and it was decided that Dr Octavius would be kept as the main villain, as he was both a visually interesting and physical match for Spider-Man, and a sympathetic character. Raimi changed much of Otto's backstory, adding the idea of him being a hero of Peter's, and how Peter was trying to rescue Otto from his demons rather than kill him. When Tobey Maguire signed on to portray Spider-Man in 2000, he was given a three-film contract, which is common for superhero movies such as this, as studios like to be confident with pursuing sequels. While filming Seabiscuit in 2002, Maguire apparently suffered injuries to his back, and Sony was faced with the possibility of recasting their lead. Jake Gyllenhaal was in talks to replace him. Replacing the lead for a sequel is a major risk, but many people got confused thinking Toby was Jake and vice versa, as they looked a lot alike. They even played brothers in the film Brothers in 2009. There were rumours that the back issue was blown out of proportion by Toby's agent to wrangle a better deal with his contract, as Spider-Man made a huge amount of money, and the people representing Toby felt he should be paid more. Things weren't made entirely clear in the press at the time, but Toby of course returned, and with a large salary of $17 million. In the film, they make references to his bad back, with his attempts to gain his powers back, and hurting himself in the process. Jake would eventually become part of the Spider-Man franchise, as he was cast recently to play the villain Mysterio in the Spider-Man Homecoming sequel, titled Far From Home. For the sequel, Spider-Man's costume has some minor changes throughout. The colours were made richer and bolder, the spider chest emblem was given more elegant lines and enlarged, the eye lenses were somewhat smaller, and the muscle suit underneath was made in pieces to give more flexibility to Toby and the stunt performers. The helmet Maguire wore under his mask was also improved, with better movement for the false jaw and magnetic eyepieces which were easier to remove. For the other cast members, we have the talented Alfred Molina as Otto Octavius, who is later penned with the name Dr Octopus. Molina was cast in early 2003 after Raimi was impressed with his performance in Frida. Molina was very familiar with the Spider-Man character, but apparently wasn't aware of the villain Dr Octopus, but was very excited to take on the role and started to get into shape for the part. Donna Murphy was cast as Otto's wife Rosalie. Some of you Star Trek fans will recognise her from Star Trek Insurrection. Kirsten Dunst is of course back as Mary Jane, she has started to live out her dreams of becoming an actress, and has a new boyfriend and intends to marry, but still has strong feelings for Peter, and can't move on without knowing Peter's true feelings. James Franco is back as Harry Osborn, he has become the head of Oscorp and looks to replicate his father's success by funding Otto's new experiment. He still blames Spider-Man for the death of his father, and is using all his resources to locate him to seek revenge. 
Rosemary Harris as Aunt May is finding life difficult without Uncle Ben and has been struggling to pay the bills and is in need of selling her home. The character of Aunt May was changed from the comics. Most of the fans knew she didn't like Spider-Man but becomes more of a spokesperson for superheroes under Sam Raimi's direction. J.K. Simmons returns as J. Jonah Jameson who is still carrying on with his vendetta against Spider-Man. Sam Raimi's brother Ted returns as Jameson's assistant and comes up with a new name for Otto Octavius. The late Bill Nunn is back as Robbie. In the movie they give the impression that he kind of knew that Peter was in fact Spider-Man. We are introduced to Kurt Connors played by Dylan Baker. Kurt is Peter's college physics professor and a colleague of Otto Octavius. I presume at the time they were setting up his character to eventually become the lizard in further sequels which sadly never happened. As Peter Parker has a new apartment we are introduced to his new landlord played by Ilya Baskin and his daughter played by Magena Tova. As with many Sam Raimi movies we get some great cameos with the writer of Evil Dead 2 Scott Spiegel attempting to eat a pizza, Bruce Campbell as the usher at the theatre and a quick moment with director John Landis as a surgeon. He played a similar part in Darkman. Shared universe folks. Dan Hicks from Evil Dead 2 and Darkman pops up on the train. We also have a quick shot of Thomas Jane near the end. Thomas would star as the Punisher that same year. Also the little kids who find Spider-Man's mask are actually Toby's younger half-brothers. Spider-Man started shooting in late 2002, even when the script wasn't finished. To film all the background plates for the train fight sequence, as they knew this would require large amounts of CGI that would take months to complete. 16 large format cameras were brought in to shoot the exterior of the subway train scene. To cover every angle of the train, six Panavision Super 65mm cameras were brought in, with eight additional VistaVision cameras. Sam Raimi originally intended the film to maintain an aspect ratio of 185 to 1, like Spider-Man. However, when he realised that in order to have Dr. Octopus and Spider-Man in the same shot, the frame would need to be wider in order to accommodate Dr. Octopus's mechanical arms. So Raimi changed the ratio to 235 to 1, but shot most of the movie in the Super 35 format, not opting to shoot in anamorphic, as it becomes more difficult and time-consuming to complete the CG effects with the squeezed image. Principal photography began in April 2003 in New York City. The crew moved to LA to shoot scenes doubling for Manhattan such as catching the robbers, the bank sequence and seeing Spider-Man in the alley struggling to understand why his powers are fading, which was the same alley used in Sam Raimi's 1990 movie Darkman. They made use of the universal backlot for the outside of the theatre and seeing Otto escape from the hospital. The filmmakers brought back the Spidey cam and installed it with the VistaVision camera to allow them to express more of Spider-Man's world view in high resolution. At times dropping 50 stories and with shot lengths of just over 2,000 feet in New York or over 3,000 feet in LA. For some shots the camera would shoot at 6 frames per second for a faster playback increasing the sense of speed. Filming was still going on after Christmas 2003. The production designer thought of the idea of a collapsed pier for Ox Layer reflecting an exploded version of his previous lab. A quarter scale miniature was built and a central railroad dock left rusting in the water in New York was used as reference. For the opening sequence Sam employed talented artist Alex Ross to create a recap of the first film in comic book form, following a similar path to the opening title sequence of Superman 2. Instead of using clips they went with artwork. The film opens with Peter struggling to juggle his normal life and his alter ego as Spider-Man. Saving people's lives on a daily basis is now affecting his job. He loses his position as a pizza delivery driver and Jameson is only after photos of Spider-Man to further discredit the web slinger. But Peter needs the money to pay his rent and reluctantly sells Jameson a new photo of Spidey. Peter forgets it's his birthday as he visits Aunt May to find Mary Jane and Harry waiting to surprise him. Peter is very much in love with Mary Jane but can't take the next step. MJ still has strong feelings for him but is getting frustrated with Peter in his struggles to be honest with her. Harry is now head of Oscorp and introduces Peter to Otto Octavius who is developing a fusion based energy source. Octavius wears a harness of powerful robotic tentacle arms with artificial intelligence. During a public demonstration a power spike causes the fusion reactor to destabilise. Octavius refuses to shut down the reactor which goes critical, killing his wife and burning the inhibitor chip blocking the arms from his nervous system. Spider-Man comes to the rescue and shuts the experiment down, destroying it in the process. Doctors prepare to surgically remove Octavius' harness. However, without the inhibitor chip, the arms have a mind of their own and attack. Upon regaining consciousness, Octavius escapes and takes refuge at a harbour, becoming increasingly influenced by the arms AI. He is encouraged to rebuild the reactor to continue his work, but he requires the capital to do so. 
Mary Jane becomes engaged to astronaut John Jameson, the son of Bugle publisher J. Jonah Jameson. Peter suffers an emotional breakdown over his inability to balance his life, resulting in him losing his powers. He abandons his Spider-Man identity and returns to his normal life, and attempts to reconcile with MJ. With no Spider-Man around, crime levels in the city begin to increase rapidly, and Dr. Octavius has nearly completed his new reactor, and needs one more key ingredient to make it work, and pays a trip to Harry Osborn, who will only help if he brings in Spider-Man so he can unmask the wall crawler and kill him. An extended cut of the film entitled Spider-Man 2.1 was released on DVD and Blu-ray in 2007, around four weeks before the release of Spider-Man 3. The cut included eight minutes of new footage, with new special features not included in the original release. The additional footage doesn't radically change the film or improve upon it. The new scenes mostly include moments of comedy, there is an extended moment of Peter celebrating his birthday, Peter being introduced to Otto's wife, Spider-Man changing back into his normal outfit as he drives to the theatre and arrives too late for a slightly longer moment with Bruce Campbell. Spider-Man has a longer chat with the guy in the elevator. We see Peter figuring out that Otto's calculations were incorrect, a few extra fight scenes with Dr. Octopus. We also see MJ shopping with a friend and discussing her proposal to her fiancé. I suppose the one scene that grabbed people's attention was seeing Jameson wearing Spider-Man's outfit and jumping around his office. I remember there being a lot of adverts for this new release. It's only 8 minutes longer, it's not some super duper extended cut or say director's cut. It now comes included with the film and isn't sold as a separate release, so it's a welcome addition. But these scenes were clearly cut for pacing issues and didn't further add to the story and would have probably just wound up being included as a deleted scene on the disc. The Oscar winning visual effects for the sequel were again handled by Sony Imageworks with additional help from Edge FX under the supervision of Academy Award winner John Dykstra. The effects took a major step up over the previous film. Seeing Spider-Man in computer generated form looked far more believable this time round and the transitions from live action footage to CG elements was far more effective. Everything just looked more polished and being in a cinemascope format it just made New York look huge and all the action sequences look epic in scale. Sam Raimi tried to push as much of the action within camera as possible, so we have Spider-Man on wires to jump out or swing into frame, and having the CG artist rotoscope out the wires and harness. To create Dr. Octopus's mechanical tentacles, Edge FX were hired to create a corset, a metal and rubber girdle, a rubber spine and four foam rubber tentacles, which were 8 feet long, weighing in at 100 pounds. The claws of each tentacle were controlled by a single puppeteer. Each tentacle was controlled by four people who rehearsed every scene with Melina to give a sense of movement, as if the tentacles were moving due to Octavius's muscle movement, but CGI took on a lot of the workload to do things that would be impossible to puppeteer and to lift Otto into the air, but in order to save money where they could, they would use the practical arms as much as possible. After 14 years, the visual effects are still amazing. There is of course the odd few shots where they got very ambitious with CG doubles for characters such as MJ and Doc Ock, where it doesn't look entirely real and feels like a video game cutscene. It's a bit similar to the quality of Matrix Reloaded, with Neo battling the huge number of Agent Smiths, but it keeps those types of shots to a minimum. Even with Spider-Man's more colourful outfit, the colours do change when it comes to blue screen sequences. I always noted the colours look more dialed back. It may be an issue with compositing blue screen with a blue outfit. It's an issue they had with the Superman films back in the days of optical effects, but I didn't realise it was an issue with digital compositing. It may actually be a result of the image being graded and the colours having shifted. It's hard to know. My personal favourite moment seeing the visual effects really deliver on creating exciting action is the rescue of Aunt May, seeing Peter save MJ from the car that comes smashing through the window. It looked incredible with its execution and one of the best moments of him using his spidey sense. The battle with Doc Ock on the train is the finest action sequence in the film and probably one of the best of the superhero genre. Its direction and rhythm with its editing make it tough to beat. This sequence I guarantee made it win the Oscar. Danny Elfman returned to compose the score to Spider-Man 2, with additional cues provided by composers Christopher Young and John Debney. Danny had worked with Sam Raimi a number of times before with the likes of Darkman and Army of Darkness, but working on Spider-Man 2 strained their working relationship. Danny said in interviews after the film's release that he felt it was a miserable experience resulting in him not returning for Spider-Man 3. During the editing process of the film, Sam had tempted the film with a lot of music by Christopher Young, mainly tracks from the film Hellraiser. 
Sam was pushing Danny to replicate Young's style for certain scenes, which Danny tried in his own way, but refused to just copy the music from Hellraiser. Danny felt Sam got so attached to the temp music that he couldn't even adapt his own material during the scoring process. Danny got so frustrated that he said, go hire Christopher Young, which they did, but he even struggled to get what Sam wanted. So they just ended up licensing the cue from Hellraiser. Composer John Debney was also brought in to finish off additional cues to get the score completed on time. Danny Elfman later reflected, Sam wasn't the same person he knew before working on the film. He likened it to body snatchers. Somebody put a pod next to him and when he awoke, he wasn't the same person I'd known for a decade. It's the first time I ever walked from a director in 20 years and hopefully the last time I have to turn my back on somebody. But Sam and Danny did eventually manage to resolve their differences and patch things up come the feature film Oz the Great and Powerful in 2013. The score did get a release in late July of 2004 containing 15 tracks of music. It had portions of Danny's work plus additional cues of John Debney's and Christopher Young's work that didn't end up in the film. Me personally, I never got super excited about Danny Elfman's themes for Spider-Man. I know I'm kind of in the minority as there are many fans of his work on these movies. I don't mind the themes, but the music sounded too much like his work on Batman and Darkman, which I've highlighted before in my review of the first movie. The action cues do a great job complementing the visuals and I enjoyed the themes for Dr. Octavius, but nothing really stood out to me to make me want to rush out and buy the soundtrack. The best moments for me are the quieter and more tender moments throughout the film. They elevate the emotions and once we get the reveal of Spider-Man's true identity to MJ, it was a brilliant moment and the music just hit the right note. With all the problems and additional music by other composers, you do get a sense with your ear that the music is a bit patchy in places and tracks appearing copy and pasted from the original film, so the overall score doesn't quite have its own voice. Despite the soundtrack being out of print, you can find it for a reasonable price on eBay and Amazon. There was also a soundtrack album release featuring all the rock and pop songs featured in the film, which you can get for peanuts on the second-hand market. This album reached the top 10 charts in the USA on release. In some countries, one or two of the tracks on the CD were changed, but none featured the best song in the film, and that was Michael Bublé's cover of the classic 60s cartoon theme, kept with that jazzy style and Michael's voice just make it a perfect modernized rendition. Reward, look up. Here comes the Spider-Man. When it came to video games, of course there was one based on the movie. Spider-Man has had his fair share of decent video games over the years. There of course has been some stinkers, but like Batman he managed to have some fun titles since the days of the 16-bit consoles. The game follows the plot of the film but has side missions featuring other villains from Spidey's universe such as Rhino, Black Cat, Shocker and Mysterio. This version was developed by Treyarch and published by Activision for the Xbox, PS2 and GameCube in time for the film's release. There were also versions for the GBA, Nintendo DS, Sony's PSP, and Nokia's failed Engage. The console versions of Spider-Man 2 received very positive reviews. Critics and fans loved the realistic and life-sized Manhattan. You had this sandbox gameplay giving you the option to do what you wanted. You can stick to the main story or go off for complete side missions. It's what the later Batman Arkham games would take inspiration from. Most gamers, including myself, would spend most of our time just swinging through the city. It was the most effective attempt at letting the gamers play as the web slinger to date. The game featured the voice talents of Tobey Maguire, Kirsten Dunst, Alfred Molina, who helped with the cutscenes, but the best part is Bruce Campbell, providing his voice for the in-game guides, and throws in his usual charm and wit to give the game some humour. For the time, the game featured very impressive cutscenes, and the main gameplay had a strong frame rate and was well animated. The character models looked a bit rubbish and were criticised at the time, but having this large open world without performance issues was impressive. Critics did complain at the time the game was too easy and the missions were a bit repetitive, but in all it sold very well and was ranked the best Spider-Man game ever made, but recently the new one for the PS4 has taken that title. The game was also ported to the PC and Mac, which felt like a dumbed-down version for a younger audience and featured less challenging gameplay. Many PC gamers felt the console ports could have easily been ported over. The console version of this game is still fun to this day and due to its popularity, you can get the title very cheap. If you want the best port of the game, it's recommended to grab it on the old chunky Xbox. This film came out when I started working as a projectionist. The hype for this movie was off the chart. It was all people could talk about at work and online during the days of me using forums to chat about movies. Everyone was desperate to watch it after seeing the trailers and the strength of the first movie created this huge demand for it. Once I got a chance to preview it, I was blown away by how good it was. It's rare for sequels to top the first movie and exceed it on all levels. 
Spider-Man 2 makes massive improvements to its visual style, jumping from the Academy flat ratio to 2351 CinemaScope, which made a huge difference, especially when it came to the action and seeing Spider-Man swing through the city. Having cameraman Bill Pope jump on to do the lighting gave the movie a solid comic book visual style. The colours just pop, and under his direction he removed that muddy orange style of the first film. It was clear the crew took everything they learned on the first production and improved upon it, taking what worked and what didn't. Seeing Spider-Man in CGI form didn't particularly look that real with his first outing. With the increased budget and knowledge in place for Spider-Man 2, it's far more seamless seeing him jump from live action to a computer-generated double. As mentioned in my previous review of the first Spider-Man film, the Sam Raimi trilogy has close ties to the Christopher Reeve Superman series of the 70s and 80s, with its familiar plot beats. As the film tackles Peter's struggles with balancing his superhero duties and daily life, he begins to lose his powers and makes the choice for a normal life to be with MJ. In the case of Superman 2, Kal-El is only human for a short while, to then get his ass handed to him and he realises he made a huge error when he finds out Zod and company have invaded Earth. We sadly don't get to experience Clark for long as a human, but also his actions are seen as selfish. For Peter, we the audience don't get the impression that his decision is a selfish one. We understand his plight and the difficulty at his age to do both things. He is far more vulnerable and emotional compared to Superman. Peter Parker has always been a more relatable character, most certainly in the comics. That's why kids and teenagers have a huge connection to him, as they feel they can relate in some way to his problems. And the movie perfectly captures that tension and drama in his life, and thanks to Aunt May, he gets the encouragement he sorely needed to do what is right. Peter has been battling his own demons and can't speak to anyone for help. Sure, he speaks to Uncle Ben to say he no longer wishes to be Spider-Man in a dream sequence, but he needed a sense of clarity and that comes in the form of Aunt May, who really is the voice of reason for him. Out of the Spider-Man trilogy, this one is definitely the best when it comes to comedy. Every scene with Jameson is pure gold. Seeing JK and Ted Raimi bounce off each other with the snappy and quick-witted dialogue makes me want more scenes in the Daily Bugle. Come the third entry, it's clear the filmmakers knew audiences loved these moments and pushed the comedy more, but ultimately it felt a little forced. Peter's new landlord is one of my favourite supporting characters, a not a slob and spends most of his time pestering Peter for his rent money. Even with the great moments of comedy, the movie is excellently balanced with serious and tender moments. The scenes between Aunt May and Peter are very moving and bring the film down to a real reality. It's a rare moment to see in a big blockbuster superhero film, when May wants to give Peter some money for his birthday, but he knows she needs it just as much as he does, she gets very emotional demanding he take it. It always makes me well up every time I see it, it's superbly acted. The love story between Peter and MJ is always in the background, as they both struggle to really get their feelings across. Peter especially as he keeps holding back and giving MJ mixed messages, and carelessly messes her around. MJ is juggling two men in her life, and Peter is the one she really wants, but he can't show any commitment. She finally breaks and speaks her mind, but Peter doesn't respond well, and she makes the ultimate choice to get engaged, which leads to Peter becoming depressed and losing his powers. With the big reveal that MJ finds out that Peter is in fact Spider-Man, I still remember that feeling when it happened. It was such a powerful and emotional moment. Once he pulled his mask off to reason with Otto, you knew MJ would eventually see him. Harry at this point had been shocked to find out, but we knew MJ deep down knew that Peter was really Spider-Man down to that kiss and had been forever knowing that Peter was hiding something. Once she makes the decision to be with Peter, it was a great relief that they finally got together and that she knew the full story and got to say that classic MJ line, go get em tiger. Casting Alfred Molina was an inspired piece of casting. He plays the part so well it makes it one of the most memorable comic book performances of a villain in years and still to this day one of the best of the Marvel Universe. Villains in a classical sense are broken people who were good at one point, but turn to a negative way of thinking due to a loss of a loved one, or how they have been wronged in life, which leads them on a dark path, or in some cases they believe their way of thinking is for the best of humanity. They don't know in their mind what they are doing is evil. Dr. Octavius loses his wife and becomes manipulated by his tentacles to continue his experiment, which will lead to the destruction of New York. His intentions are noble, but he is blind to his ambitions, not knowing his calculations are wrong. He is a good man at heart, and as soon as we are introduced to him, he seems the perfect role model and friend to Peter. Seeing Parker with Otto and his wife is a wonderful scene that shows that Peter can be himself and feels comfortable with them. He has made new friends that accept him. This scene was vital to the script to make us care about Otto, and also gave Peter a window to reason with Otto at the end when he confronts him as Spider-Man with his mask off, 
to persuade him to make the right decision. The scene in the hospital as the surgeons try to remove the tentacles from Otto is classic Raimi. I know once Sam was attached as director for the series, fans of his work were overjoyed to see him tackle a popular superhero. He already had his taste of the genre with his own creation in Darkman. In the case of Spider-Man, he dialed back his traditional style to play it safer for mainstream audiences. This may have disappointed some hardcore fans of his work, but thankfully he brings back his classic action and horror style to this sequence. I was so pleased when this scene kicked in. Great crash zooms and quick pans. Everything we come to love from his Evil Dead movies. It was a nice nod to let fans know that he was still Sam Raimi. Spider-Man 2 shows us that when Sam puts his serious cap on, he can match any other top director with action, drama and romance. Since it's nearly been 15 years since it came out, people's attitudes change on a film and things you may have loved at the time may seem dated or cheesy when you revisit them years later. Spider-Man 2 still holds up very well, but you could argue the montage of Peter enjoying himself being normal again is a tad corny. Tobey Maguire does pull some of the silliest faces when it comes to the action with his mask off. Plenty of memes have been created with his funny expressions. Spider-Man still doesn't really have wisecracking and funny dialogue. Spider-Man has so many enemies due to him bullying them and making fun of them. He has an ego when he becomes the web crawler. Raimi's version of Spider-Man is more clean cut and less cocky. Come Spider-Man 3, they do make better efforts to give Spider-Man a bit more of an attitude. I suppose it's difficult to imagine Toby and his interpretation of the character to act in a more traditional way of what we come to expect from Spider-Man and how he interacts with these villains. I always found it a bit odd that Harry starts hearing his father's voice and sees him in the mirror and begins to talk to him. Norman only lost his mind once he had taken the enhancement drugs and begins to communicate with the darker side of his personality, but Harry hasn't gone that route as of yet. Maybe due to Harry breaking down emotionally, it leads to him to break from reality and leads to his father's attempts to get revenge on Spider-Man. The fans knew that Harry would become another version of the Green Goblin. The film teases on that notion nicely, but in execution for part three, it doesn't quite deliver which I will discuss in more detail in future for a review on Spider-Man 3. Spider-Man 2 is still one of the most competent and effective superhero films in the last two decades. We have been spoilt over the years as Marvel has dominated the big screen developing a cinematic universe that I never imagined as a kid I would ever see. In the early 2000s we had X-Men that gave some new life into the superhero genre, but Spider-Man really felt like the comic strip had come to life and was treated with respect and also made by a filmmaker who loved the comics and the characters and it shows on screen. With all sequels they are intended to be bigger and better. Spider-Man 2 is that. The action scenes are more explosive and exciting but the action is not just there for the sake of it. It's all driven by the plot. The story dictates the action and not the other way around. If you strip out all the action sequences it's still a great movie. The past decade we've had two reboots of Spider-Man with two different actors. Despite some good casting, the films in my eyes just don't hit the right spot when it comes to delivering a solid Spider-Man movie. The Sam Raimi series is not perfect, but out of all the Spider-Man features we've got over the years, Spider-Man 2 is still the best outing of the web slinger, and still to this day one of the best superhero movies ever produced, and a brilliant sequel. I want him dead too, Flint. That's why I've been looking for you. I want to kill the spider. You want to kill the spider. Together, he doesn't stand a chance. Interested? Wow. Mm. Tell me you love me. I love you. I love you so much. I always have. <laughs> Originally, we thought that this man, Dennis Carradine, was your husband's killer. We were wrong. The actual killer is still at large. What are you talking about? This is the man who killed your husband. His name is Flint Marco. He's a small time crook who's been in and out of prison. Well, why, why weren't we told about this? This man killed my uncle, and he's still out there! Flynn Marco, the guy we tied to the Ben Parker homicide. What about him? He just broke out of Rikers. And? He's on the run. He's in the marshlands. I think we got him. Remember me? Yes, father. I was right about her. 
about Peter, about everything. You know what you must do. Make him suffer. Make him wish he were dead. First, we attack his heart. Harry. You knew this was coming, Pete. Never seen anything like it. You look at it in the morning and run some tests. Can we do that now? It seems to like you. Don't let any of that get on you. Why not? It has the characteristics of a symbiote, which needs to bond to a host to survive. And sometimes these things in nature, when they bind, they can be hard to unbind. What do you want from me? Remember Ben Parker? What does it matter to you anyway? Everything! Everybody needs help sometimes, Peter. Even Spider-Man. Spider-Man swung back onto the big screen for his third entry in the hugely popular series in late April 2007 for its premiere, and the film got its general release in early May. Again directed by Sam Raimi at a cost of over $250 million, some reports said it was closer to $300 million, making it the most expensive film ever made at the time. As Spider-Man 2 was such a huge hit with critics and fans of the iconic Marvel character, the hype was out of control for Spider-Man 3, and Sony went into overdrive to promote it, and it eventually grossed nearly $900 million worldwide, making it the most successful film that year, and it would prove a big hit on DVD and Blu-ray. The previous two entries had received strong reviews, but Spider-Man 3 didn't get the same love, with most reviews being very mixed, with some praising its production values and action sequences, and with others calling out its messy script and its inclusion of too many characters. The New York Times said the film mostly just plods, and said it lacked humour. Richard Roper of the Chicago Sun-Times gave the film only two stars out of four, feeling for every slam-bang action sequence, there are far too many sluggish scenes. Roger Ebert also gave it the same rating, saying the film was a mess with too many villains, subplots, romantic misunderstandings and conversations. On a positive note, Jonathan Ross, a big fan of Spider-Man, felt the film was the best of the trilogy, and magazine Total Film felt Spider-Man 3's complex plot helped the film's pacing in that it rarely feels disjointed or loose. Of course, with any Spider-Man movie comes with a wealth of merchandise to appeal to children. Hasbro released several toys to tie in with the film, this included a deluxe web spinning blaster, along with several lines of action figures aimed at both children and adult collectors who had cash to blow on large scale and more detailed figures. A video game was also released that will be discussed later in the video. To celebrate its 10th anniversary in 2017, Sony put out a new cut called the Editor's Cut, which removed two minutes from its runtime. Alternative scenes were included, some original scenes were extended or removed entirely, such as Harry's servant revealing the truth and how his father died. Instead, this new cut has Harry just look at a photo of him with Peter and MJ to change his mind. More of Christopher Young's score was also restored. Despite the negative reviews, the strong box office encouraged plans to continue with a fourth entry in the franchise. There were talks at the time that Sam would be taking on the directing duties of The Hobbit and leaving Spider-Man behind him, but obviously he never committed to that series. Raimi had wanted to pursue with the Vulture for Spider-Man 4. Felicity Harding, Vulture's daughter, would appear as the Black Cat, and in one version of the many scripts that would be produced, she would have an affair with Peter in order to shatter his engagement with Mary Jane. Dr. Connors would also finally transform into the Lizard and there were also rumours of Bruce Campbell getting a larger role in the franchise, appearing as Mysterio. Sam Raimi went through many drafts and revisions and was never happy with any of them. At one time, the idea of shooting two sequels concurrently was under consideration. However, Sony Pictures announced in 2010 that plans for Spider-Man 4 had been cancelled due to Raimi's withdrawal from the project, as he couldn't commit to a script and the release date. Sony decided to reboot the series in 2012 with Andrew Garfield in the lead. That series came to an end in 2014 due to the poor reviews for its sequel, so Spider-Man was recast yet again with Tom Holland in the lead in 2017 with Spider-Man Homecoming. 
Years later, Sam Raimi reflected on Spider-Man 3, saying, It's a movie that just didn't work very well. I tried to make it work, but I didn't really believe in all the characters, so that couldn't be hidden from people who loved Spider-Man. I should have just stuck with the characters and the relationships and progressed them to the next step, and not tried to top the bar. Development for Spider-Man 3 began soon after Spider-Man 2's release, and Sony set a release date for summer 2007, so they had about three years to plan and finish the film. Sam Raimi's brother Ivan wrote a treatment with Sam over the course of two months. Sam wanted to focus on the Sandman and the Vulture as the main villains of the film. He was in talks with Ben Kingsley to play the part of the Vulture, but talks ended when the producer Avi Arad convinced Raimi to include Venom instead. In the early writing process, Eddie Brock did make an appearance as to set the groundwork for his potential transformation into Venom in future. Avi felt the series had relied too much on Sam's personal favourite Spider-Man villains, and not characters that modern fans were actually interested in. So Sam Raimi included Venom to please Avi Arad and the studio. Sam wasn't really a fan of the character, but began to appreciate the famous villain more as he went through the writing process, and he felt he would return to his original idea of including the Vulture for a potential fourth entry in the series. Eddie Brock would serve as a mirror to Peter Parker, with both characters having similar jobs and romantic interests. Brock's actions as a journalist would reflect contemporary themes of paparazzi and tabloid journalism. Sam always found Sandman a visually fascinating character, and wanted to expand upon his background and not just have him be a petty villain as he was portrayed in the early comics, so they decided he would be Uncle Ben's killer to increase Peter's guilt over his death, and challenge his simplistic perception of the event. Sam also needed to conclude Harry Osborne's storyline. Harry would not follow his father's legacy, but be instead somewhere in between. With the symbiote being included, they wanted to explore Peter's darker side, which Tobey Maguire found exciting. This would send Peter on a different path, affecting his relationship with MJ and introducing a new love interest with Gwen Stacy. Overall, Raimi described the film as being about Peter, Mary Jane, Harry and the Sandman, with Peter's journey being one of forgiveness. With so many additions, Alvin Sargent, who was hired again to rewrite and polish Ivan and Sam's work, soon found the script so complex and overstuffed that he considered splitting it into two films, but abandoned the idea when he could not create a successful intermediate climax. Outside of the returning cast members, we have Thomas Hayden Church, playing as Flint Marco, aka Sandman. Thomas was approached to play the part because of his award-winning performance in the film Sideways, and accepted the role despite not reading the script. Thomas worked out for 16 weeks to gain 28 pounds of muscle. Flint is a small-time thug and has escaped from prison to return to his wife and sick daughter, for whom he aims to steal money to help get the treatment to cure her. He transforms into Sandman following a freak accident and incurs Peter's wrath when Peter learns he was Uncle Ben's true killer. Tova Grace, the star of that 70s show, stars as Eddie Brock, who later transforms into Venom. Eddie is a freelance photographer in desperate need of a full-time job and is competing with Peter at the Daily Bugle. At first, Topher was puzzled he was approached to play the part, since in the comics, Brock is a middle-aged, muscle-bound guy. Topher's first reaction was that it was a bad idea, saying people are religious about not straying too far from the page. But Topher Grace figured Raimi knew what he was doing when he explained that Brock, in the film, would be a kind of dark doppelganger to Parker. Once in the costume for the third act, he found it quite unpleasant, as he had to be constantly smeared to give a liquid-like feel to his outfit. The outfit took an hour to put on, though prosthetics took four hours to apply. Toe for Grace also wore fangs which bruised his gums. Bryce Dallas Howard plays as Gwen Stacy, who was Peter's first love in the comics. Bryce strived to create a sense that Gwen could potentially be a future girlfriend for Peter, and not someone who was there to steal Peter away from MJ. Howard performed many of her own stunts, having to wear tight harness around her waist and stomach. She was unaware of the fact she was several months pregnant. James Cromwell plays as Captain George Stacy, Gwen's father. James has been a star of TV since the 70s, and has appeared in many big movies such as Babe, Eraser, Deep Impact, Star Trek First Contact, and Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom alongside Bryce Dallas Howard. We have minor roles for Lucy Gordon as news reporter Jennifer Dugan. Lucy sadly committed suicide in 2009 at the age of 28. Newscaster Hal Fishman appears as himself, anchoring the kidnapping of Mary Jane by Venom. He unfortunately died just 14 weeks after the movie opened at the age of 75. And finally, we have cameos from Bruce Campbell, playing as a maitre d', the late Stan Lee, and Cliff Robertson returning as Ben Parker for what would be his final role on film as he passed away in 2011. 
Shooting was scheduled to start in early January of 2006, but to plan ahead for the extensive visual effects sequences, the camera crew went to New York in November 2005 and spent two weeks photographing all the buildings for the FX crew to reference and replicate in the computer. Principal photography began in January and wrapped in July 2006, after over 100 days of filming. They made use of Sony Pictures in California, where they would shoot interior sequences and specific action scenes, for example the crane sequence featuring Gwen Stacy. The production moved to Cleveland due to the Greater Cleveland Film Commission offering production space at the city's convention centre at no cost. The city would double for New York for Spider-Man's first battle with Sandman. The demanding shooting in Cleveland meant that a section in downtown was shut to the public. The pavements had to be repainted to resemble those in New York and traffic signs and electricity poles were removed for stunts. They doubled the amount of days shooting in New York compared to Spider-Man 2, starting in late May and finishing at the start of July. They took advantage of various locations, Times Square, Central Park, City Hall, Manhattan Plaza and areas in Brooklyn. Shooting started taking a toll on Sam Raimi, who was juggling several units at once to get the location footage in the can. Cinematographer Bill Pope was having a difficult time as well, as the symbiote Spider-Man, Venom and the new Goblin were costumed in black during fight scenes, taking place at night. Test audiences got to preview an early rough cut of the film, and the results were mixed. Many felt it needed more action and a better resolve to Sam Man's journey, so Sam Raimi had to go back and do some reshoots just prior to the release. Sam was working on the film right down to the last minute, with Sony constantly over his shoulder pressuring him to finish on time. The film opens with Spider-Man being celebrated by the city of New York. Peter is in high spirits and is finally happy in his life and plans to propose to MJ who has just made her debut on Broadway. Peter and MJ are relaxing in Central Park and unaware of a meteorite that lands nearby. Out of the meteorite a black goo emerges and attaches itself to Peter's motorbike as he and MJ leave. Harry Osborn has taken a performance in Hearts in Gas and is out to seek revenge against Peter for his father's death using his Green Goblin technology. With a surprise attack, he and Peter battle it out over the streets. During the chaos, Peter takes out Harry, causing him to suffer a head injury, resulting in him having amnesia, losing his memory of Peter as Spider-Man. Across town, Flip Marco has escaped from prison. It's revealed that he was behind Uncle Ben's death, and the police are on his tail. He falls into an experimental particle accelerator that fuses his body with the surrounding sand. He transforms into Sandman. He can now control sand and reform his body with it. To celebrate Spider-Man, the city has a festival to honour him after he saved Gwen Stacy's life. Peter gets carried away and lets Gwen kiss him, in a similar fashion to how he was kissed by MJ. MJ seeing this is furious. Suddenly Sandman appears and attacks an armoured truck. Spider-Man jumps into action and attempts to stop him, but unaware of his abilities he loses the fight and Sandman escapes. Peter learns of Flint's history and his involvement in the death of his uncle. Peter is desperate to find him and his anger begins to get the better of him. The alien symbiote is attracted to his powers and rage and assimilates the suit. Peter awakens on top of a building and discovers his strength has increased. Peter locates Sandman and battles him in a subway tunnel. Discovering that water is Flint's weakness, he opens a pipe releasing water that reduces Sandman to mud and washes him away. Spider-Man thinks he has killed him. Peter's anger begins to take over as he loses his temper quickly. He appears to subtly change as his hair turns darker. The symbiote is slowly bonding with Peter and he is finding it increasingly difficult to detach himself from it as his addiction to it is like a drug. At the Daily Bugle, Peter exposes rival photographer Eddie Brock whose fake photos depict Spider-Man as a criminal. Publisher J. Jonah Jameson fires Brock and hires Peter to be a star photographer. Eddie is now unemployed and wants to get his revenge. At the same time, MJ and Peter's relationship is starting to fall apart, and Harry's memory has returned. The visual effects for Spider-Man 3 would be supervised by Scott Stockdyke. John Dykstra, who won an Academy Award for his work on Spider-Man 2, declined to work on a third film, instead choosing to work on Hancock. Stockdyke's team of 270 people worked for more than two years to create 950 shots, and they were one of many studios that worked on the film. That list includes Evil Eye Pictures, Furious FX, Gentle Giant Studios and Giant Killer Robots to name just a few to help with the huge workload. The visual effects budget alone was approximately 30% more than the previous film. Sony Imageworks had a huge challenge on their hands. They had two new villains that had to be created in the computer, both radically different in their execution and visual style. Also provide photorealistic models of the actors for a number of the complex action sequences. The film would incorporate every technique in the book to achieve the shots. 
They had in-camera wire work and stunts, miniatures, blue screen and computer generated material. For the first big action sequence they had Peter being attacked without his mask. Image works needed to create a photorealistic digital stunt double for Toby. The studio had used the light stage system motion capture software previously for Spider-Man 2 and Superman Returns, both having mixed results, especially on Superman. The crew devised a new system for Spider-Man 3. The studio captured the actors' faces in various lighting environments and applied that texture to 3D models animated with facial expressions, with the help of a new motion control rig. The look of the Sandman went through many designs and experiments were done with 12 types of sand, such as splashing, launching it at stuntmen and pouring it over ledges. Animating Sandman involved creating a performance for a shell shaped like the character that contained sand and moving individual grains of sand inside the shell and falling from the character's body. To move individual grains of sand, Imageworks took several approaches. They used particle simulation, a new simulation engine called Sphere Sim, and RenderMan plugins, sometimes in combination. Thomas Hayden Church was often superimposed onto the screen, where CGI was then applied. The first shot of the Sandman forming took roughly six months to create. When animating the symbiote, Sam Raimi did not want it to resemble a spider or an octopus and to give it a sense of character. The CG model is made of many separate strands. Animators saw tubular shapes on screen that represented each curve's final look. Using simple rigs, they could place a curve after curve to crawl the goo along an arm or build claw-shaped rigs that reached out for a host like a hand. To give the animated goo a secondary motion, the effects team used cloth and hair simulation on the curves to help the goo ooze and jiggle as it transforms and reshapes. When animating Venom himself, animators observed footage of big cats such as lions and cheetahs for the character's agile movements. In the comics and 90s cartoon, Spider-Man's black suit had a white spider design on the front and back. In the film, it just becomes a black version of his traditional suit, which makes perfect sense, but I do wish they had something more familiar to his comic book version. I do think the visual effects have stood up well over time, despite the intense workload the FX crew had. I think the beauty of combining many separate elements of live action material with miniatures and CGI, those scenes are the most impressive, especially with saving Gwen and the final battle. The symbiote effect seamlessly blends with the footage and the birth of the Sandman is still pretty incredible. The action scenes that incorporate blue slash green screen work are lit well enough for the elements to fit together and not look too fake. It's tough for the FX crew to hide some of the visual traits of CGI that give the illusion away, especially during a daytime sequence where this happens a number of times in the film. With the fast camera moves and edits you can keep the audience focused on the action and not have them looking for the flaws. The weakest element is unfortunately the CG doubles for Peter, Harry and MJ. The uncanny valley thought comes to mind. They look like porcelain dolls in some shots. It's an effect that artists still can't get right even today. The human eye can instantly spot if something doesn't look quite right. Aside from those issues, I think they deliver on the spectacle and keep the standards high throughout. For Spider-Man 3, composer Christopher Young takes over, replacing Danny Elfman, who had no desire to compose the sequel due to having a bad experience working with Sam Raimi on Spider-Man 2. You can find out more about that in my Spider-Man 2 retrospective. Chris wasn't given the job straight away, he got the call about three months into production. Apparently Sam Raimi had auditioned six different composers for the job, but admitting he really wanted Chris Young. Christopher had to familiarise himself with the scores from both the first and second film. It wasn't until he sat down to spot Spider-Man 3 that he decided which of Danny's themes he was going to use and when and where they should be implemented. He did his absolute best to honour the material and figure out a way to come up with his own music, but at the same time acknowledge what Danny had done in the previous two films. Sam Raimi encouraged Chris to come up with instantly identifiable melodies or motifs for the new set of villains. Chris wanted to write catchy themes that had a distinctive personality. They had to be aggressive. He wanted the black suit Spider-Man to have a scary theme and the opposite for the Sandman theme, which is low, aggressive and heavy. Venom was supposed to be vicious. Chris was told that he was the devil personified. His theme ends up being much more demonic sounding. The score sadly has never been officially released. Chris Young was interviewed and asked why. He highlighted that Danny Elfman has to greenlight it as it uses his themes. Danny requested at the time that any reference to his thematic themes, such as ones composed for Spider-Man and Green Goblin, had to be removed from the cues for the CD release. And since it was an understanding from the beginning that Chris was going to adapt Danny's music, by removing those themes made the CD release pointless. At the time, Sony put out an album featuring a selection of songs from the film, such as Snow Patrol, The Killers and Black Mountain. No tracks featured Chris's work. 
this album didn't sell particularly well and probably put off Sony from pursuing a score release. The Spider-Man 3 score out of the Raimi trilogy is my favourite. The new themes for Sandman and the Black Spider-Man are really impressive. Sandman's first appearance has this very heartfelt melody that evolves into this low menacing march. The dark theme for Spider-Man has elements of Chris's work from the Hellraiser films. Chris throws in jazz for Peter's fight with Harry which works extremely well. Jazz should always be part of Spider-Man's score, as New York is such an important scene for jazz music. I think with Chris and Sam's horror background, they really get a chance to flex their skills in this area, due to its darker themes and ideas. Some of Chris's best work is in the editor's cut, where we see an extended scene of Peter sitting on his bed, and he is tempted to put on the black suit. As he opens the case, he sees the suit is alive. A very cool scene, and scored brilliantly. As the film does have a downbeat ending in the recent editor's cut, Chris had composed an alternative cue that is far more uplifting. It's a huge shame his score isn't readily available. There are bootlegs out there and you can sample tracks on YouTube. It's certainly worth a listen. The video game based on the movie arrived on all the gaming platforms, turning up on the Game Boy Advance, PC, Nintendo DS, PS2, Nintendo Wii, PSP, Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3. Like many video games based on movies, they expand on the film's plot to throw in additional characters, such as Kingpin and Craven, drawing upon elements from the comics. The game ends up being loosely based on the film. The majority of the cast, excluding Kirsten Dunst, provide their voices for the cutscenes. A few supporting characters from the film, such as Gwen, Aunt May and Captain George Stacy, are removed from the storyline. Bruce Campbell once again returns to be your tour guide throughout the game and provides some great humour. Whereas the video game for Spider-Man 2 was praised by the fans and critics, the third video game less so, maybe due to the rushed nature of it. It was pointed out for being Spider-Man 2 with a new lick of paint, and it wasn't well implemented on the PS3 and 360. At the time those versions were praised for their graphics, but had performance issues with the frame rate dropping a lot throughout, the camera getting lost and graphical glitches here and there. The boss battles became very repetitive, the side missions were dull and got boring very quickly. Some publications gave it 3 out of 10, and others were more favourable. Since its release, it hasn't aged well and is best avoided. The PlayStation 2, Wii and PSP versions had the stories changed in areas, with some villains being swapped out for other ones. It features adjustments to its story and was shortened in areas. It was criticised for having poor controls and disappointing graphics, but the game's performance handled better, with less of the frame rate dropping issues compared to the more modern console versions. The Nintendo DS game is a standard side-scroller, with a touchscreen option thrown in. Not particularly exciting, and the GBA game had weaker graphics than the previous Spidey games on the handheld. So overall, the games exhibit problems and just don't really deliver something that is memorable. If you want your fix of web-slinging action, play Spider-Man on the PS4, which is a fantastic game and is the best Spider-Man game to date, though it is missing Bruce Campbell. I, like everyone else, was desperate to see Spider-Man 3 back in the summer of 2007. The quality and strength of Spidey 2 just left us wanting more. The third film arrived when I was still working as a projectionist, and I got the preview at shortly before its general release. There was a collective groan from the other staff members after it finished. I was also a bit underwhelmed by its overall quality. I think the first thing that came to one's mind was that it had too many characters and storylines that all don't get enough screen time to be fully fleshed out and satisfying. You certainly get a sense that Venom and Eddie Brock had been crowbarred into the story. It feels that it really wants to focus on Sandman and Peter and MJ's relationship. As we know Raimi was forced to include Venom to please the producers, what we get is an overstuffed script. Even by 2007, you'd think filmmakers and producers would have learnt their lessons of the past with including too many characters, i.e. villains, into a film. It never does it justice. We saw this happen with the Batman films of the 90s as the villains took over and Batman found himself just in the background of his own movie. Even though the film is stuffed with storylines, it also wastes time on scenes that could have been cut out to add more character development. Harry and MJ just dancing around in the kitchen, it just made me roll my eyes, and it's cringy to watch. Peter strutting around New York trying to show off as he descends into his darker side. As I mentioned in my older review of Spider-Man 2, the Spider-Man films have similar traits to the Christopher Reeve Superman films. The third movie has Superman turn evil, and the same for Spider-Man 3. Peter's montage has elements that did make me laugh, in particular him talking back to JJ and sitting in his chair, but they go too far with it. It just ends up not being funny, and it brought on a wealth of internet memes. Speaking of the humour, the previous two films were full of great gags and comedic moments. This one fails to hit the mark. 
The gag involving Jameson having to be reminded to take his pills just falls flat. The scene with Bruce Campbell is pure gold though, and the best of his appearances in the trilogy. Sandman was supposed to be the main focus of the film. He clearly gets shunted to the side halfway into this film. He is supposed to be trying to save his daughter, but little screen time is dedicated to that, and we never get a chance for him to be alone to collect his thoughts or share them with someone to really explore his character for there to be a solid arc for him. It's only at the end we get this emotional scene with him and Peter as he apologises to him for the death of his uncle. It's a good scene but felt like a quick way to wrap things up due to the failings in the script. His transformation into Sandman is a fantastic sequence, but how this comes about is so poorly executed. He just randomly falls into this experiment that's taking place. This is the sort of writing you'd see in a cheap TV series, not in a feature film. Spider-Man 2 set up that JJ's son John was going into space. He now has beef with MJ for leaving him for Peter, so their conflict could be explored. So I was expecting Jameson's son to bring the symbiote back with him for Spider-Man 3, and he would turn into Venom. It would follow the comics and cartoon in that respect. So if you were a fan of Venom, I expect you may have felt shortchanged with their slapdash approach of introducing the alien and Eddie Brock's eventual transformation into the villain, which happens all too quickly at the end, as it tries to rush to get Spider-Man to face off against him and Sandman. I read the Venom storyline as a kid and enjoyed the 90s cartoon, which nicely covered Peter's experience with the symbiote and Brook's encounter with it, so it feels like a missed opportunity in this film to really explore more of Eddie Brock and his experience with the symbiote to create confusion in New York City. For example, people would think it was Spider-Man attacking the innocent and committing crimes. Harry losing his memory was so contrived and a clumsy excuse to get one of the villains out of the picture so they can deploy him later on. When he is trying to come to terms with his amnesia, he tries to connect with MJ. He reveals he once wrote a play for her, which took the levels of cheese up to 11. Some of these conversations are just embarrassing and lack the quality of writing we received in Spider-Man 2. There is nothing wrong with Franco's performance. He does a really good job of playing a villain once he attempts to ruin Peter's relationship with MJ. But everything leading up to this exhibits clunky writing. Gwen Stacy has no business being in this movie. Bryce does a good job with it, but again there's not enough time given to the script to do anything with her. Her father should have been introduced in the last movie, with a minor role perhaps to hint that Gwen may appear later on. Gwen is used to cause friction between MJ and Peter. Gwen clearly likes Peter and he is naive to her advances and affection, but with how things play out with Harry coming between MJ and Peter, Gwen's role within this story just ends up being pointless. MJ quickly becomes frustrated with Peter and their relationship. Peter unintentionally is insensitive, and for once in his life he is happy and fails to realise MJ is having her own problems. MJ spends a majority of the movie being upset. She loses her job due to complaints about her quality of singing. In reality, if her voice wasn't powerful enough, she wouldn't have got the job in the first place. That's why they have auditions. She then thinks Peter is cheating on her and is forced to dump Peter at the wishes of Harry. So there isn't anything for her to look forward to and Kirsten looks kind of bored throughout and yet again thrown into being the damsel in distress for the third act. So things I do love about the film, of course the score by Christopher Young, it's the best looking film out of the series. Bill Pope really amps up the colours and contrast, giving it a more comic book flavour, with inky blacks that come with a darker tone and introduction of Venom. I do love that Sam Raimi gets to flex his horror skills as a director, pushing the symbiote imagery. And when Venom appears in his full form, he gets to be really scary, and Sam uses his horror tools to make those moments work. The action scenes are really well executed. Sam Raimi is a pro when it comes to that. He knows how to deliver thrilling action sequences. The final battle, which does have some great moments as Spider-Man really struggles to fend off Venom and Sandman. That scene when he's on his last legs trying to reach out to MJ is a powerful emotional moment, and then Harry comes in to save the day for a nice team-up battle. The finale, however, does arrive pretty quickly, with a news report thrown in to speed it up, oddly feeling out of place, as a breaking news report of this nature hasn't been deployed before, and its execution makes it unintentionally comical. I think the film's strength is really getting across Peter's guilt for what he has done. You get a strong sense he can't correct it quickly by just saving the day. The emotional core of this movie is strong and Toby goes through a lot of emotions, making it very believable. It's a shame Sam Raimi had difficulties with the studio which hampered the overall quality of the film. You think by the third entry they could trust Sam to make the right decisions creatively to make a successful film, but I think Sony relied so much on this series for their profits 
it becomes an issue of risk, and they want to please everyone to make sure the film will be the biggest hit. With so many voices in the production and at Sony wanting their ideas implemented, we have been delivered a compromised film. We've seen it happen so many times before with sequels over the years, especially with superhero films. They never seem to learn and just have their eyes fixated on the huge profits they think they can make. If Sam Raimi just got to make the film he wanted, I think we could have been given a solid trilogy that could be up there with Star Wars and Lord of the Rings etc. Heck, we could have seen more adventures of Spider-Man with Raimi behind the lens, but that wasn't to be, and Sony in their lack of patience delivered us a batch of reboots. Spider-Man 3 is still enjoyable to watch despite its overly depressing tone and direction. It's not really a feel-good movie. I have warmed to it over the years. The hype was so strong before it came out, I suppose it was difficult for them to meet those expectations. I would give the editor's cut a go though. Not a huge amount of changes, but you may get a little more enjoyment out of it. I just wish they had held back and kept things simple. Two villains max per movie. Any more than that, it becomes problematic. If they had followed the structure and direction of Spider-Man 2, it could have been a perfect third entry in the series. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button and click the bell to be notified of my latest retrospectives and reviews. Big thanks to my patrons for supporting the channel. If you want to get involved and gain early access to my content and exclusive videos, then follow the link below.